welcome to the Gen Z Show. I am your host, James McLam, and I'm joined today uh, with my daughter, Sarah Beth McLam. How are you doing, Sarah? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing fine. I don't know exactly why I had to throw in your last name there. They ought to be able to figure that out. <laughs> so today, you and I got to talk with an old friend of mine, someone I've known for well over 30 years, who is currently in a new role. I uh, just had this role this year. It is Mr. Scott Stump, who is the CEO of the National FFA Organization. Now, for a lot of our audience, you probably know what the National FFA Organization is. But for those who are new to it, the National FFA Organization is the student organization for students enrolled in agriculture education in middle school or high school. Middle school or high school, if you have an agriculture education program, this is the student organization involved with. And Scott serves as the CEO of that organization, which has, he's the what, three quarters of a million people, uh, students yep. that they're enrolled in, which is just a phenomenal number here. So Sarah, what was one of your takeaways today in our conversation with Scott? Well, he is, let me just say this. Uh, he is a wise person. He is so wise. And I gained just a lot of wisdom about life and leadership from him. But I have to say, he mentioned human connection and how as leaders, we are just driven by human connection, human experience. And I really love just his words of wisdom on that. But you're going to have to watch the video to figure out exactly what I'm talking about. Scott describes himself as a builder of people and systems, and I think that should go on his business card because he truly is, throughout his career, uh, been a builder of, of people. He is going to mention some resources that National FFA has that anyone can access. You can look for those in the show notes, but you're really going to learn a lot from uh, this one of the Groves expert on youth leadership development. I don't think you can discount the fact that this man is one of the Globe's experts on youth leadership development because he has been on the front line doing this since day one of his career. So let's join our interview with Mr. Scott Stump, the CEO of the National FFA Organization. Scott, welcome to the Gen Z Show. Thank you for, for agreeing to be our guest, and, and it's great to reconnect uh, with you. So thank you again. Absolutely, James. I'm so glad that our paths, the paths crossed many years ago and that they're coming back to cross again and bring you greetings from the National FFA Center in Indianapolis, Indiana. Well, Scott, a, a lot of our audience is going to be familiar with your role that you have in, in the organization that you work with, the National FFA organization, but it, this may be their first opportunity to meet you since you're relatively new to your job. Would you mind sharing a little bit about yourself and introducing yourself uh, to our community? Understanding too, there may be some who, who may not even know anything about what the National FFA organization is as well. Absolutely happy to do that. Uh, no, we are not the, uh, uh, the Federal uh, Aviation Association, so not FAA, we are FFA. <laughs> And uh, what FFA is, is a national student organization, one of the largest, uh, not just in the country, but in the globe, uh, that's focused on students that are interested in pursuing pathways and careers in the agriculture industry or related industries. Uh, we've got about a three quarters of a million students each year. Mm -hmm. We get the opportunity to work with, uh, and our sole purpose and the reason we exist is to develop their potential, much like Gen Z, the work you do for premier leadership, personal growth, and career success through ag education. And ultimately, uh, we want them to be the next generation of leaders who are going to change the world uh, in the way that we provide food, fiber, and fuel for this world. So tell our audience, how did your journey in the FFA begin? How did, really, what was the catalyst, the stimulus that, start, that got you excited uh, about this world and, and led you to this path? Yeah, uh, I was a student uh, of agriculture in high school and participated in FFA activities there. My father was my agriculture education instructor. Uh, I, oh, I didn't know that. that. I, I tried to get away from it, James. I went to Purdue University in biochemical agricultural engineering. I was going to be one of the scientists that would change uh, the way we uh, feed this world. Um, but then I spent a year as a state FFA officer in classrooms across uh, the state of Indiana, um, really spending time with students and trying to get them from wherever they were at, point A to, to B to C to Z, to uh, wherever they wanted to move along that leadership continuum and, and caught the bug and decided that God placed me on this earth to be a, 
a builder of people and a builder of systems that build people. And so ultimately, I uh, ended up switching my major to ag education and went back and taught in Indiana, then went to work for National FFA the first time uh, in the early 90s. And uh, my sole job was devoted to writing leadership and professional development curriculum, ultimately helping students unlock uh, the potential that was within them and challenge them to take that uh, set of new skills and go back and change their communities, their school, uh, their future. And uh, yeah, then uh, had the opportunity to work in state leadership, uh, skill development in Colorado. And then uh, for the past three years, actually spent time at the United States Department of Education uh, as the Assistant Secretary for Career and Technical Education. So the whole federal system of how we help people get the skills they need to do uh, better in their life uh, and in their work. So you mentioned me to FFA. (laughs) <laughs> well, you mentioned about uh, writing curriculum early on in leadership uh, development. So what would you consider two or three of the, the major skills that you think that you should learn uh, in order to help them in their leadership journey? What would be those two or three? You know, I know there's a whole litany of lists. We could go on a lot, but, you know, hit, the, hit on the top two or three that come to your mind immediately. Yeah, and uh, I'll just go through it in kind of my progression of, of where those moments hit uh, that uh, changed my trajectory. And one of the first ones, uh, I've actually written the curriculum, but I was sitting with students going through it, experiencing it. And so uh, we had people, uh, the students early on create, as freshmen in high school, a personal mission statement uh, to really define their purpose. And, you know, there's lots of books out there, Purpose Driven Life and a lot of others that really help you say, wh- what is the change that you want to make in the world? Where do you want your impact to be based on your skills? To me, that starts with the deep reflection of uh, why am I here? And in my case, uh, it became very simple and I've already said it. it. It's to be a builder of people and a builder of systems that build people. And from that point on, uh, no matter what role I was called to, Uh, or what position I served in an organization or an entity, uh, it was very easy when they said, why do you want this role? And I said, well, I see it as an opportunity to build people, and that's what I do. So that would be one. Two, uh, I would say it becomes about initiative. Um, My dad always said, uh, don't be the one that waits for things to happen, make things happen. Uh, And the large part is that because uh, he just had lots of things to do and just didn't uh, need me sitting around not doing anything. And I will tell you, from all of the employees that I've been able to supervise and work with and other colleagues throughout the years, uh, those that have continued to grow in their positions, grow in their work, grow in their vocation, grow in their service, have been the ones who are constantly looking for, uh, what is it? Uh, Where can I have an influence in this situation? What can I contribute that will better uh, this environment? Uh, And then they don't just sit back and wait for somebody else to do it. They pick up the proverbial gun wrapper on the ground because it's a piece of trash and they throw it in the trash can. So let's be uh, those that take the initiative. So, okay. That got my mind (laughs) kind of twirling there. Um, So hopefully fingers crossed, um, I'll be an ag teacher at this time next year. Um, And so thank you for choosing to be a teacher. Of course. I've wanted to do it since I was, little, little itty bitty. Um, So as a teacher, specifically agricultural education, I know so many who just want to promote this why, promote this, how can you make the world a better place? How can you take initiative? What are some of those like just tips that you have for people who are developing youth, leading youth, trying to get them to see this bigger picture of like, you are here for a reason. There's a why behind it. What are some tips you have for training um, some people in that direction? Yeah, the you know, one of them would start with uh, walking them through that process of uh, yeah, truly creating uh, that, that mission statement, which begins with the question why, and and knowing that it will have to go through lots of iterations, um, because you know early on as uh, you're thinking through that process, you have different grand ideas. Some of them stick and some of them don't. And I will tell you that uh, my purpose evolved over the years. But in that moment, they, those young people do need coaching and feedback. Um, they need someone that, that will listen and say and challenge them. Uh, you know, my three children at home uh, for many times over the past uh, uh, five, 10 years, as they've been working towards uh, being out on their own and picking the place that they're going to exert their influence in life. Um, yeah, I continually ask them, is that really what you want to do? The other thing we asked them to do was to have an authentic experience with it. And, and Sarah Beth, you know that in agriculture education and FFA, we ask students to do things outside the classroom 
so that they have an authentic chance to, to practice experience and know whether that's what they want to do or not. And so a part of that purpose and mission development is not just writing it down, but actively doing things in that space to prove that it's authentic and right. Uh, and that's probably the most important piece. I think you should put on your business card instead of uh, CEO of XFA, you should put builder of people and systems. I like that. <laughs> I would love to see that on a card because I think that just like speaks so much uh, to who you are and what you're about um, as as going forward on these things. Do you think there are you think leadership development has changed in the in our approach to how we train students uh, over the course of year? You and I came through, you know, we're we're children of the '80s. We came through '80s. Is it different now on how we? approach leadership development in youth than it was then? And if so, why? Oh, I, I, I don't think the concepts have changed as much as the culture of the different generations. Uh, and as we look at specifically, and I've got the, the book behind me, I haven't started reading it, but I've uh, already taken the excerpts out of it. But, you know, Gen Z, so that you would fall into, and my daughter would fall into, um, you know, came into this world at a very different time than James, you and I were working our way through the uh, the, you know, the 70s and 80s, uh, at, a, at a time when, you know, they, they saw the downturn in 2012 and 20, or 2008 and 2012. And it made them say, you know what, uh, this whole thing about work uh, and the fact that it can go away in a heartbeat and somebody can take a job away, uh, really set that generation up to be much more cause purpose oriented to begin with. So in my opinion, sorry, but you're going to have less of a hard time than we did 20 years ago of trying to help people find their purpose because they've already been seeking it for a while. Your task is going to be just to pull it out of them and then foster it. And that'll be so cool. Uh, as we look at uh, you know, the generation alpha that's coming along the way, uh, that's gonna be pandemic influenced, we as leadership specialists are gonna need to look at that generation and meet them where they are, as opposed to just use what we've used in the past because they are very different in their approach uh, to this notion of how to influence others, which to me is the true definition of leadership. Mm. What are some of the different uh, or, or different approaches you think that that Gen Z needs to have, you know, as far as the way we instruct them on leadership development versus you know, millennials or even us who, who are Xers? Um, yeah. So the first one I would say is that uh, from the very beginning, they, they're very cause driven. Uh, one of the other pieces that struck me as I was uh, learning about Gen Z is that, you know, they are have a tendency to be, I don't want to say, frugal in a different way, but value oriented uh, when it comes to purchasing items, you know, so uh, like my daughter uh, absolutely loves Lululemon. I don't know if that's something that uh, Sarah Beth you are familiar with, but um, no. there you go. <laughs> well, but it, she would much rather get something that lasts and pay a little bit more for it, save up for it versus just pay for the first thing to meet the need. And so as we think about that from an impulse standpoint, um, really looking at those individuals being in for more of the long haul as opposed to just needing an immediate fix. And what that means for leaders is uh, they're willing to invest uh, in uh, a longer term relationship or a longer term uh, training. Uh, they may want to have not just a, a, an initial experience, but have a plan for where they're ultimately headed down the line. So um, I don't know that I can speak to it exactly, um, but I tell you, uh, it, it, we do just need to dig in uh, to uh, where that generation is at and meet them where they are because uh, uh, you know, they're going to be the largest uh, generation before too long. So mm -hmm. that, is, that is very true. So as you were talking, you said this cause and um, reaction, basically, like if they see a need, they want to meet that need um, and kind of be in that area. Um, so while I was student teaching, I actually found that if I gave my students something that they could like actually work on, like if I was like, hey, there's this problem, it's a real world problem. We're not just learning about all these plants and all these tools for no reason. Like people actually solve these issues and I gave them a problem to solve. Um, they were more like they wanted to do it. So what are some problems that you see like that are just facing our world right now that you think um, that within the next 10, 15 years that our generation could solve and kind of like your vision for that? Like what are some issues you see? How can we solve those? Yeah, so in, in my area of primary interest right now in the, in the world of landscape of agriculture, uh, you know, by 2050, uh, this world will uh, gain another 2 billion individuals and we'll be just under 
10 billion uh, individuals to feed and to uh, clothe and to provide with fuel and other resources to get them around to where they ultimately need to be. Uh, so this notion of hunger uh, and how do we, not just on a global scale, but even with those that are going hungry in the United States, um, how do we create uh, a different way of uh, feeding uh, those individuals? Uh, as we look at the expansion, uh, solving the problem of how do we sustainably create enough food to feed 10 billion people uh, while keeping the land regenerative uh, to a status that absolutely it can continue to produce for years and years and years to come. How do we do that on a smaller footprint? Um, how do we do that in a way that decreases uh, the environmental impact of uh, uh, carbon uh, in the air? And how do we sequester it and do a part of uh, solving, being a part of the much bigger solution? So there's lots and lots of problems out there. How do we keep water clean and safe and get it to communities that are currently without it? Mm. I'm gonna put a spin on it for you because I like, I want some more, like you're, you're saying all these really good like ideas that it's now turning the wheels in my head. I'm going to put a spin on it. Uh, Leadership side, character development. What are some issues that you're seeing there um, within like students, within potential leaders? Um, Because I know that people, they develop character over time. Like you have to have a good, strong character. And I know that youth today look a lot different. I'm just assuming here than they did um, back when y'all were going through school. Like they're, they're facing different issues in terms of development as people. Um, what are some issues that you're seeing now um, in your role as like the CEO of FFA? Yeah. You know, the, uh, the one that comes to mind, and it's one that FFA has been working on for years uh, and we'll continue. We're in the process of uh, developing our strategic plan for the next uh, three-year window uh, that will launch in January. And one of the topics that comes up again and again uh, actually is informed by um, yeah, Josh Bledsoe, who, James, you would know. And uh, the University of North Carolina, there was actually a professor that uh, wrote a book uh, uh, that I've been reading for the past week and a half that is all about this notion uh, of diversity and equity and inclusion, especially in the ag space. Historically, we've been a very monolithic um, entity and culture. Um, But as we look to the future and start considering where we're going to be able to feed the population of the world, it's going to take uh, uh, all types of uh, cultures, backgrounds, ideas, and influences. Um, And yet we have some of our uh, individuals uh, within FFA that grew up in uh, communities uh, where everyone looks like them. And, you know, as uh, Dr. Nacosta, who wrote the book, uh, put it, he says, yes, there's that inherently going to be at the beginning, uh, t- some, uh, whether it be tension or just uh, an unfamiliarness as we start to branch out with people that are not like us. Uh, but that's the piece, the social dynamic that uh, we can equip students with. Uh, you know, this country, the last census uh, took us to the point where uh, our, uh, you know, the, the population continues to rapidly diversify. We also had um, about one in 10 individuals from rural communities that move to urban areas. And so there's going to be a greater mixing of individuals. Uh, as leaders, uh, we don't get to pick and choose uh, necessarily who our followers are. We need to, uh, to accomplish the big uh, problems in the world. We need to make sure that we're harnessing the talents of all students. Wow, uh, that's, that's powerful. And what it's doing, because that is different than than really the thought process that that we had. Uh, I mean, I remember some of the issues that were that we discussed during our time with FFA was really how do we broaden the view of, of agriculture, that it's not just farming, that it is more than that. And I think we have done an amazing job with that uh, going forward on this. Well, and I would just go on with that, James, that you're exactly right. That would be the other piece that within, uh, yeah, the part of our strategic plan is, uh, reclaiming our relevancy to the industry. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I look at my uh, second son who uh, thought he was getting away from agriculture, uh, but he's dually certified in AI. Now, uh, some in the audience listening to this might go, are there two different types of AI? Could you immediately go to artificial intelligence? Because that's what's in the news these days. But uh, Ross was uh, first certified in artificial insemination, and he bred his own herd of Black Angus uh, cattle and used that to buy a MacBook to then program apps for the iTunes store. And his first app was a little app called iJudge, which uh, for the livestock judging individuals listening in, it would uh, do the calculations between the judges uh, placing, your placing, and cut scores. And um, he sold enough units on that to help pay part of his way through Colorado State University. But now he works for a company called Trimble. And Trimble 
is the geospatial company that works both in ag and construction to do all of the auto steer uh, precision ag for the, the tractors. He also is looking at data sets through his art, uh, the art, machine learning and artificial intelligence side, looking at pictures of plants in Northern California and really working to say, how do we train a robot through AI to be able to pick a strawberry, to pick a head of lettuce, to pick um, you know, a, a, an apple off of a tree so that uh, at some point in the future, we can decrease the labor impact in some of those areas and really get uh, product to harvest in different ways. So there are big problems out there. Ultimately, we in ag need to see ourselves as future IT professionals, but with rooted in an ag background so that we can solve the big problems with the technology that's now available. Scott, going back to, to leadership development and, and focusing on the how we do that, we grew up in an era, and it's still to a certain extent, that we bring students to conferences, that we access them, you know, we bring them access to workshops or camps or conferences. What do you, how do you see that trend changing now with technology? And especially since we're coming out, well, since we're in the middle of COVID, where everything has had to be virtual, how do you see that working? Because the reason I ask this question is, from a personal standpoint, we tried to switch what we did at Gen Z uh, to a virtual standpoint this year, and we saw some eagerness to be involved with it, but some too, a virtual fatigue from students saying, we're just tired of this, we want to see person. So what do you see going forward? I know FFA has to decide what how they're going to deliver uh, their leadership development. So what do you see going forward on that? Well, the world is not the matrix. If you've ever seen that movie, uh, <laughs> we are not living in a virtual world. We're living in a very interconnected, uh, personal touch driven world. And uh, yes, we uh, will be having a back in-person national convention uh, this fall, October 27th through 30th. And even though uh, there are some schools that can't attend because uh, uh, either school board or others did not deem it safe within their state, we do currently have about 27,000 uh, students that, uh, and guests that are registered and will be joining us in Indianapolis. So I know, well, let's put it this way. Um, to, to your listeners who are out uh, certified doing these uh, events, why do people still go to a concert mm -hmm. when they can just listen to the song anytime they want? It is absolutely a different experience. And because it's a communal experience and humans were meant to celebrate things together. And uh, whether it be growth uh, in the leadership areas, whether it be a national convention where you have speakers, it is the, the ambiance of being in something much larger than yourself that allows you. I mean, my first national convention, James, I don't know about what you felt at yours, uh, but uh, going into the municipal auditorium and seeing that stage and uh, seeing the speakers come out, which uh, I can't remember for sure, but I, I know that Zig Ziglar was on our stage uh, quite a few times over the years at National FFA. But allowing yourself to be in that moment more than you were when you were back at home in your little community. It's that gathering together that allows that to happen. And uh, we absolutely hope that in the fall of 2022, we'll be back up to the 60, 70,000 number that we historically have been at with our event. Um, but I'll tell you this, it uh, really comes down to uh, that interaction between people uh, that can't happen on Zoom. Now, good side benefit, that can provide for other access and other resources. Because last year with a virtual convention, uh, instead of hitting 70,000, we had 270,000 that were able to connect in and experience parts and components. So there is a need, but finding the right place and the right content and the right uh, vehicle to deliver what you're trying to deliver. Uh, we've got more options now and that's great. Let's use them, uh, but then let's target the experiences that need to happen in person, in person and the other items. Absolutely, let's do them via Zoom because we can reach more. You think more of a hybrid uh, of live and virtual going forward? Absolutely. And it can even be synchronous and asynchronous. Uh, if there are things that individuals can do on their own time, and you think about uh, some people uh, actually perform much better and listen better, learn better uh, late in the evening or early in the morning, uh, you know, uh, not just a, you know, uh, synchronous jump onto this Zoom, but hey, uh, read down through this or watch this video or do this uh, Web quest on your own, and then let's come back and talk about it and do a fishbowl around it. Mm. I mean, it's so important for us to be able to, to, to reach them and meet them where they are, but at the same time, be able to do it in a way that's engaging with them. And 
when we did, we, we do a program that we call Catalyst Leadership. And it was our answer to, you know, the virtual setting. And it went really well. Sarah Beth was one of our presenters. Um, and, and it was an exciting time that we had. But I, after it was over with, my first thought was, we got to pare this down. We need to make sure it's a little bit more biteable because I think we went too long. Uh, we didn't lose anybody. They stayed with us the whole time. But I thought it was the length of it was too long. But I, I like what you said. And this is going to be our hashtag comment for this is that humans are meant to celebrate things together. That's that's good. That's that's going to be that's going to be hashtag. So those of you folks who are out there, look for that during when we release this. Well, I actually wanted to touch on that really quickly um, because you talked about how we need human connection. We need interaction in order to truly be in a moment and experience things, um, which kind of goes back to this like relational. Um, we are relational people. Um, which means that we are relational leaders. Can you touch on that just a little bit, like how you've seen like leadership training, um, how you expect it to like just expand in the future in terms of building relationships with people, how we can be in the moment more and just truly experience and be a leader um, through human connection? Yeah, I, uh, Sir Beth, I've read many, many leadership books over the years, some that I did just to learn new content so I could uh, write it out for an FFA leadership uh, conference. Others, uh, just for my own personal uh, growth and development. But one of them, what I find is as I've read through them, some things stick and are proven true time and time again. Other things just kind of fade away. Uh, John Maxwell's, uh, you know, uh, developing the leader within you uh, and the, the levels of leadership. If you remember that, if you've ever seen it, but, you know, every leader and like me coming into this role as the CEO of National FFA, I have a lot of rights. I can spend up to a certain amount, but I never imagined somebody would trust me to spend. Uh, I can hire and fire individuals. I can uh, have a key to every room in the building. And so uh, those are my rights, but I get nowhere with my staff until I develop, as Maxwell said, a relationship with each and every Mm -hmm. one of them. They will not follow me until I have established an emotional and empathetic and a, a relational connection with them. So to me, that's the most critical piece of any leader stepping into a new environment it's not about your goals and your dreams. It's about what are you getting the collective to do? Because this collective of 100 people here in this building who are talented, tremendously uh, gifted and purpose-driven people, uh, together we can accomplish a huge amount. Uh, but that's got to be uh, through the relationships and it's got to be together. Mm. Do you have any advice for how to build relationships with people you work with, people who you coach, um, anybody really? Do you have any like advice that's worked in your life or that you've seen work in other people's life? Or we could take it a step farther, Sarah Beth, since you're looking to be a teacher. Scott's had that experience as well. And it's, it's, you know, how do you connect with your students is to be that way? You know, care about them personally, uh, first and foremost, and then care about them professionally. Uh, and that for you, Sarah Beth, means, and I, uh, I don't know if it was my teacher educator at Purdue or uh, another individual a mentor, ag teacher that told me this, uh, but he says, if you want to really uh, uh, shake up students a little bit, uh, first day of class, meet them at the door, shake their hand and introduce yourself, have them introduce themselves. And every day after that, when they come back into the room, meet them at the door. Uh, because it shows you as a student are more important than the content I'm providing you today. So for me, what that looks like is instead of sitting here at my desk all day, uh, I make laps uh, around the building, just checking in with people and just saying, uh, uh, there's another great book if uh, you want to look it up, but it's called The Way of the Shepherd. And it's about knowing the condition of your flock. And that to me is all about caring about that relationship and then care about them professionally. And for me as a teacher, that means I I want them to grow. Uh, Nobody should be static in the roles that they're in. And I want to invest in uh, and I'm asking them consistently, what's the next step for you? Where is it that you want to expand your talents, expand your influence, expand your impact, and then uh, provide the right investments to allow them to get the training skills, uh, experiences uh, that can allow that to happen. Mm. I like that. Her teacher educator is a Purdue alum. You know who it is? Let's see if you can tell me. Dr. Travis Park. That's right. right. I was just with him the past two days. So. Well, really? You were, he was up there. He was in Indianapolis at the national council for ag ed meetings. Very cool. Very cool. I need to reach back out to Travis. One question is on a personal note that we love to ask our guests is what is the greatest piece of advice that you have ever been given? I actually said this when uh, to the national office, FFA officer team back in January when I uh, met with them for the first time. And 
it goes back to uh, founder of Ralston Purina. So all the Purina feed that you see comes out of uh, St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, but uh, William Danforth, uh, in a small, small book uh, called I Dare You, uh, really crafted the phrase, be your own self at your best all the time. And it's hard. <laughs> I don't accomplish it every day. Uh, in fact, probably less days uh, than most do I accomplish it. But you know what? I'm striving for that. And it really is be your own self at your best uh, all the time. And um, those are my father lived by. And uh, it was good, uh, good mantra of keeping your priorities in mind. So Ooh. I'm glad you repeated that because I had to write that down. That was good. And who said that? William Danforth. That's powerful. I love that. I love that. So if people wanted to connect and learn more about what the FFA does, what the leadership opportunities they provide, um, how can they reach out to you guys? What, what are some ways they can connect with you? Absolutely. Uh, FFA.org would be the uh, treasure trove of uh, all of the online information and resources. Uh, they'd be welcome to uh, join us and get the full immersion experience uh, in Indianapolis, October 27th through the 30th, the National FFA Convention. Uh, but I will tell you, we're always looking for individuals that uh, want to connect in for uh, you know, presenters. So we uh, hire a quite a cadre of facilitators for both weekend conferences and then also summer conferences. Uh, but uh, yeah, start with FFA.org. And then uh, should there be another question, uh, reach out to me, just stump at FFA.org, and we'd be happy to... Uh, uh, guide them for further resources. Are there af- opportunities for parents to get involved that maybe uh, don't have an ag program in their area? Um, I, I I know traditionally we've always been in an ag program, but is there opportunities at all now, or is that state dependent? You know, it is uh, primarily at the state level, but we have just launched uh, over the past 18 months a resource called Forever Blue that is for FFA alumni and supporters So that would be the parents and others that might not have had the experience as a way for them to engage with each other, but then also be accessible so that states can easily reach out to them if they want to, are looking for judges for state contests or uh, volunteers to help uh, with leadership development within uh, both local and state and national events and activities. Mm -hmm. And you guys are expecting, you said 27,000 plus at convention at the end of October? Well, we, we believe the registration may still go up. We're currently uh, at about 27,000 registered. Uh, we're mentally hoping for in that 30 to 35,000 range uh, that uh, we, uh, we know that we're still in the tail end uh, of a pandemic that has had tremendous impact on so many uh, individuals of all ages uh, in every community across this nation. Uh, and we truly believe that gathering together will give us a chance to um, fill our bucket uh, from a place that has been leaking for about uh, two years and uh, make us ready to step boldly out of this pandemic and uh, reclaim the promise of uh, agriculture, America, uh, and life. Scott, thank you for, for agreeing to be our guest. I was so excited uh, when, you, when you accepted our invitation uh, and immediately reached out to Sarah Beth, and she's actually skipping a class right now. <laughs> I am. You can, I'm uh, well, skipping him. <laughs> Well, if it was Dr. Parks, then you could just tell him that I'm giving you a, a hall pass to get back in or you know, excusing you from it for the day. So. <laughs> and to our audience, if you want to find out more information about how to connect with FFA, we're going to put some of the links that's, that Scott mentioned in our show notes. So if you're looking at this on YouTube, just look down to show notes. If you're listening to it on your podcast, maybe Spotify or Apple, just go to to the site, and you'll see that in the show notes as well. We'll have provide direct links there for the opportunity. Thank you again for, for being our guest today. I've enjoyed reconnecting. I've enjoyed being able to share uh, some of our thoughts going forward. It's, it's an exciting time, and, and I know that that is an often used statement for those of us who have been involved with leadership development. We're always excited about the future, but really, I, I, I have to say we have to be. We have to be optimistic uh, going forward in youth development and in leadership development, because uh, otherwise, you know, we can't accomplish our goals uh, and, and reach the objectives that we want. So absolutely. To our audience, we want you to like, share and comment on this on the podcast and, and YouTube. Someone, you know, uh, needs to hear this message and see this interview. So until next week, thank you from the Gen Z show. <laughs>